This is the hour of doom and bloom. That's right, friends and neighbors. Welcome to the Survival Medicine Podcast, a sanctum of serenity in a sacrilegious world. I'm Joe Halden, MD, that old Dr. Bones, founder, oh, co-founder of the Survival Medicine website, doomandbloom.net, where you'll find over 1,300 articles, podcasts, and videos on medical preparedness. And this is Amy Alton. I'm an advanced registered nurse practitioner and a certified nurse midwife. And I'm also known as Nurse Amy. And she's the hostess with the mostest, purveyor of some of the highest quality medical <laughs> kits on the planet. And so adorable that puppies watch videos of her. <laughs> That's right. Now what you're watching here is an experiment. The original purpose was to see if indeed a, doing a video podcast would cure my old timer's disease. And sure enough, I do have still old timer's disease, losing brain cells at an alarming rate. What can I tell you? So this podcast is a dismal failure from that standpoint, at least from the beginning. All the way from the beginning. No, what a mess. No, what a no, mess. You're doing great. Uh, honey. Well, I'll continue to do my research and try to get people a quality video podcast. You're doing a good job. Thank you, thank you. If you're interested in this stuff, I would suggest that you join our groups. We have groups and all sorts of social media that you can join. We Our special groups are on MeWe, they are on PrepperNet, uh, they're also on uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. and we're actually holding a giveaway right now for a, one of our big dental bags, yes. and so if you are not dentally prepared, you may be medically prepared, but you may not be dentally prepared, and you're worried about a long-term <laughs> event happening, well, you're gonna need to take, take care of some dental issues too. We're giving away one of our bags to only the members of our groups. Mm -hmm. So feel free to join us on MeWe, on PrepperNet.net, I think is, yes. and, uh, and on <laughs> Facebook, you can find us just about anywhere on the interweb. Yes, and our groups are all called Survival Medicine. That's right. Even on PrepperNet.net? Uh, called it Pre No, they're called Dr. Call Dr. Joe Alton Bones and Nurse Amy Alton. Okay. So that, that's, that's a different That's on PrepperNet.net. All right. Okay. Well. Yes. You know what? Before we start, you got to listen to our disclaimer. How about that? Okay. No exceptions. All right. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> All information and opinions voiced on the Survival Medicine Podcast are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent medical advice for anything other than post-apocalyptic settings. We strongly urge our audience to seek modern and standard medical care whenever and wherever it is available. Please. So today I want to talk a little bit about a common thing that just about every medic is going to deal with in a survival situation, and that is cellulitis. Now, what is cellulitis? By the way, it is not cellulite, it's like the plastic surgeons want to get rid of, or, <laughs> or I don't, I'm not even sure how they how they do that. I guess suck your cellulite out. What we're talking about is cellulitis, and that means an inflammation of the soft tissues. Now, think about this. You are in a group, you are assigning tasks to people in the group. Mm -hmm. Here, that person gets to chop wood for fuel, that person gets to build a campfire, and these people probably don't do this on a daily basis. In reality, you're gonna do a lot of things that you're just not used to doing if something really bad happens and you were knocked off the grid. I mean, if you're thrown back to the 19th century, really, mm -hmm. and from a medical standpoint. so. The infections that I'm talking about are infections of, of soft tissue, like I said, and they develop when bacteria enter through a crack or a break in your skin. Mm -hmm. Now you can imagine that off the grid that's gonna happen a lot. Now most of the time, there won't be an infection associated with it, but even the bacteria that naturally lives on your skin can easily become an infection because it doesn't belong inside your skin or right. in any of the deeper layers either the dermis or the subcutaneous fat, muscle tissue, any, any of that bacteria naturally on your skin, which is perfectly fine, is, could be life-threatening if it gets down Inside, into those areas. Right. That's right. right. And why am I talking about this today? Because I actually have a case of cellulitis. Sure enough, it was, I'll tell you the sad story, uh, I just, after doing Strange a walk for about story. two miles, I 
looked down at my leg and I saw that there was a bump on my leg and there was a little break in the skin. But he didn't show it to me. And I didn't show it to her because I didn't think it was a big deal. So I felt it in my doctorly way. A palpation is what we call yes. feeling uh, in medical speak. And so I palpated it and it popped. But the thing is, it didn't pop through the break in the skin. It popped inside. Right. And it spread all over the place and you'll be able to see some uh, images of that on your screen. Well, within a short period of time, I was sort of at the end of my rope and so I went into the emergency room and because gosh, you know, at my age, all sorts of things could really be it, the well, cause of that. It didn't clear up after we went in there on the sixth day. I mean, right. You waited six days well, for it to get better before you went to the emergency room. Well, we did. And it didn't seem like it was getting better. Right, that's true. And so, they did an x-ray. Thank goodness the bone was not involved. Right. And they apparently can tell that. So that's good because it could have been one of a lot of bad things that happen if you have something going on inside the bone. Right. Uh, it was some kind of soft tissue swelling. So that's cellulitis. Now, when that happens, it's very important to put people on antibiotics. And so they put me on antibiotics. And here I am two weeks later and it's still not completely gone. And so we have to check really into all the different things that it could be. Now, there are a number of things that could be uh, that that cause cellulitis or that are not just related to infection. For example, if you had, let's say, uh, a vein that you bumped and you broke that vein open without necessarily breaking the skin, this can happen, you would have an accumulation of blood under the skin. That is called a hematoma. Many times that turns sort of purple, but doesn't have to necessarily. In my case, it didn't, it was just red but then over the course of several days, it started turning yellow. And when that happens- Like a healing bruise like does. Like a healing bruise does. Right, moves through the colors and right. then eventually turns and, yellow. And started sinking. So it happened on my left shin and it made its way, the bruising down to my ankle. Ankle, right. So that's something that is important. Now you can also have cellulitis as a result of, or, or actually, mimicking a dermatitis, a special kind of dermatitis, it's caused by poor venous circulation. That's called venous stasis dermatitis. And in that case, you have people that have, and this happens on both, almost always on both legs, and it they have a reddish brown area of skin that just turns more and more brown as time goes on, and the skin get winds up getting rougher and, and more coarse. Right. And so that is, that's that. Now, but, and and so right off the bat, you can think one side is something that is an injury, or or not the one you just said, and then this one has both legs. That's right. So being able to sort of go through these stages of the color the texture, whether it's both sides. Um, as we're moving through and you're describing these differential diagnoses, um, just kind of think to yourself, all right, how is this different from the last thing that he described? And then you can sort of have a table of, okay, these are my signs and then what it could possibly be and then making check marks and maybe I'll make one of those on Canva and put that up on the video. That might be a good idea. And give you an idea of, of how you can clearly see uh, to the best of your ability without diagnostic testing, which is available now, modern physical science. science physical signs and symptoms. Right, but going through what you can check on uh, if you're off the grid or in a survival situation. Now, another thing that could cause an issue on one leg, and this won't happen on both legs, mm -hmm. unless you are incredibly unlucky, but maybe an insect bite, a response to an insect bite or a contact dermatitis from uh, maybe being exposed to poison ivy or something like that could cause right. swelling and inflammation of the soft tissue. Now, people say brown recluse bites always cause a necrosis of the skin, and that's actually really dependent on the amount of toxin or venom that has been injected into you. And so if very little has been injected into you, then you may not get all of that. I had basically a scab that lasted a long time. It did. It, but it's gone now. Until you went into a bathtub for a while and did like a hot soak. Yeah. That was the only thing. The showering, uh, daily showering didn't get rid of didn't it. Didn't do a thing. 
but the soaking in the bathtub uh, actually did. And so once it, the scab came off, we immediately looked at it to see if there was a hole. Because right. we were thinking, because the scab was looking black, and I'll show you guys a picture of that, because it was black, it kind of mimicked the bite that I had had. Right. Which had a black scab, a truly black scab. But when my black scab came off, there was a hole <laughs> where the poison had sort of eaten away at the tissue. And yours wasn't. It was very right. superficial and it didn't go any deeper. So that was a good thing for us to see. Now, I will say that just because an x-ray showed my bone to be intact right. doesn't mean that you couldn't have a contusion or a bruise on the bone itself. And sometimes what happens is the lining of the bone, most, bo most bones have a lining called the periosteum, a thin lining. Uh, if there was bleeding going on under there, then that could cause a swelling and that could cause possibly a, hem uh, a hematoma, accumulation of blood that's related to the actual bone. And so that's something else that you have to rule out. Now, interestingly enough, since I'm a doctor and I, of course, I, I think of all of these crazy <laughs> things that could have happened to me. Yes. I saw all sorts of different doctors. Now I saw uh, my family doctor, he said to see a dermatologist. My dermatologist said, yeah, it looks like the skin's inflamed, put me on some antibiotics and then told me to see a orthopedic person to determine whether there was a bone bruise or not. Saw so that orthopedic person, they didn't find any bone bruise. Doubted it was that. So they sent me to a vascular vascular doctor to identify whether I had a vein, uh, a blood clot in the veins. Right. And so they did an ultrasound, and they didn't find there was a blood clot in the veins, but they did find indeed that it was an accumulation of blood under the shin. And even today, even though it's slowly getting better, there's still a bump on my shin that probably yes. be there, I think, for months. So the good news with regards to the medic in a survival situation with people that have cellulitis is that most people, especially young folks, are going to recover pretty fast from right. it. Infections from minor wounds are pretty re easy to treat today. And you know, I'm a little outlier in that I'm still having some symptoms despite being on antibiotics or having been on antibiotics. Now without antibiotics, bacteria can become life-threatening. So it's important right. to Make sure that nothing has entered the bloodstream, that you haven't broken the skin and you haven't entered, and the, a bug hasn't entered the blood, blood, bloodstream. <laughs> bloodstream. <laughs> you got a tongue twister yeah, again. <laughs> we call that septicemia, or you may know it of it as blood poisoning. Now, germs that invade the soft tissue below the superficial layer of the skin, they can rapidly infect other layers below. So just be aware that this could be a pretty serious thing. It's just because you've seen someone have a swollen, like a boil or a, a folliculitis, some kind of swelling uh, or a small abscess doesn't mean that it's just a small thing. It could be an issue because right. without antibiotics, the medic in a survival situation would have to, would probably just watch people's infections spread to lymph nodes right. and then into the bloodstream and then once that happens they become what we call septic in other words a whole body infection oh i just want to say another way that you could identify cellulitis besides it usually being on one leg uh, is and it's more associated with redness than bruising itself is that there may be streaky redness, which in other words, the, the channels that drain inflammatory fluid from your body, from, from the periphery of your body to the core, that it, those are called lymph glands or lymph channels. And those lymph channels become inflamed and actually you might see some red streaking in some cases. So that's another way that you can identify cellulitis. Um, if you got somebody who has sepsis, you got a problem because they can become not only infected in the bloodstream, but it can go, it can actually the bone itself or the bone marrow itself can become infected. And in the past, well, sepsis was pretty much fatal mm -hmm. in most cases, and it certainly was going to have a higher death rate than it does today uh, if something really happens and you know what hits the fan. Now, the amazing thing is, is that the, the typical bugs that cause cellulitis 
Our you keep strength. calling them bugs. Maybe we shouldn't say bugs because every time you say bugs, everyone thinks of like oh, uh, okay, bugs. <laughs> the pathogens that cause cellulitis okay. are I actually prefer that. <laughs> it includes staph, Staphylococcus, staph, yes. and also Group A strep, Streptococcus. Right. And they don't, like I said, they don't do any harm on your skin. Normally, okay? right? They're but, just there. And but if they penetrate deeply through a, a cut in your skin, they can really cause cause trouble. And as a matter of fact, there's a resistant form of staph, which you probably have heard of, called MRSA. MRSA stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And uh, methicillin is a um, antibiotic in the penicillin family, not a, not a weak antibiotic in the penicillin family, a pretty strong one. Right. And it can definitely treat these things in most cases, unless you happen to have this particular bug, which is very, very common. Bug. Bug. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. You can say it. I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> so, sometimes you can identify MRSA on people's uh, faces, like kids' faces, on their butt. Maybe sometimes and they usually have sort of a yellowish crust along the edges of the uh, rash that goes along with that. So that's something to think about. Now the signs and symptoms of cellulitis, you have to recognize them as soon as you possibly can. That is so important. Right. They include, um, of course, discomfort in the area of infection. Uh, you might have fever and chills. I didn't. Go figure. Um, the area of the infection is going to be warm to the touch compared to a non-affected non area. Right. Check both sides equally. Right. So if you've got something on an upper arm, you check both upper arms. If it's on the Lower leg, you check both legs in the same exact position to tell if one feels a little warmer. And what I also did was I crossed my hands and I, and I kept my eyes closed. So I just sort of compared without thinking about anything other than the, the temperature that was on my fingers. Right. And indeed, even now, my, I'm a little warmer on the affected shin than I am on the opposite side. Um, swelling is going to occur also in the area of infection. The red area is usually swollen. They might be shiny in appearance, uh, cause a sensation of tightness. You may feel tight in those areas. Uh, if, if an accumulation of pus occurs under the skin, you, you may see pus actually draining or you may uh, notice some kind of cloudy fluid. We call that exudate from the area of the infection. Uh, it could smell bad also. And mm -hmm. yes, certainly if it hasn't been treated, with an antibiotic, you'll probably see that. Some people lose hair at the site of the infection. You notice a lot of people, as they get older, lose hair from uh, uh, their lower legs and mm -hmm. circul circulatory issues. Mm -hmm. um, the stiffs may be joint if the swelling involves the joint, of course. And people just feel exhausted. They just feel run down, run down, tired, muscle achy. Right. You know, they really don't. They feel like something's not right. Right. You get that that just run down feeling. And they're right. Something's not right. <laughs> so indeed, it looks like my cellulitis occurred almost exactly where the most typical area is for the cellulitis, right on the shin. We have there's so little protection. Yeah. On the shin, either you have skin and then you have tibia. Right. You have the, the, right there. You have uh, shin bone. And I'll tell you, I, it's the first time that I had ever gotten a case of this. And I Thank always goodness. I always snap back from any kind of infection so quickly. And I'll tell you something, it is pretty crazy that this is still Well, it's issue stressful point. because it can get very, very serious. Right. And thank goodness we did a, a sonogram today at the vascular guy's um, office. And there's no blood clot that seems to be occurring inside a vein. I have an, a little accumula an accumulation of blood in the soft tissue, to it, right. but it doesn't appear that any of my veins have been blocked as a result of a clot. So that's something at least, yes. and I can feel a little more confident that Relax I can be patient about this yes. thing healing. Hell, you know, I'm an old fart. So. <laughs> <laughs> and. And you, very, you have a nurse to take care of yes. you. <laughs> yes, but are you, you take care of people that, that look sinister, look like terrorists, yes. like me. Oh, you do? Even that. See that? And that's the way a medic should be. You should treat... No matter what. No matter you, what. You no matter purple, how sinister they look. Purple stripes with yellow <laughs> polka dots. I don't care. Yeah, well, I, I, I had that before, but no. that's gotten better. 
So at least that part's gotten better. Well, the makeup camouflages it well too. Now your makeup. Yes. Oh, well, He's makeup. Am I wearing? Kidding. <laughs> oh, God. No, to ca to camouflage your purple stripes and That's pink polka am. dots. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what do you do with somebody who has cellulitis? Of course, you want to want to keep a close eye on it. So you look at the red areas, and you're going to want to mark them off with some kind of here. I have a pen, pen or felt or felt tip sharpie yes. or something. So if you have you a know. redness, you want to take the take a permanent marker and just kind of take do an outline of whatever it is. Right. So you see the exact marking of the redness. And just and identify the progress of it. Right. Now, if it's going to be bad, it's going to continue to rise. Right. So it's going to continue to spread and it's probably going to rise up towards the torso. Right. And if you've got something like that going on, you've got real trouble and you definitely need that person on antibiotics. Yeah. Um, other helpful strategies to keep the limb elevated above the level of the heart that's mm -hmm. something that's important uh, some people use warm compresses or soaks to the affected area uh, i use cold a uh, cold pack in Only the beginning on the first day uh, on the beginning to try to decrease swelling right. it didn't help uh, so but, we didn't but, know but it normally it does but normally does you know what what can i say and if you ever use a cold pack or a hot pack on someone you should have a barrier between the skin which in cellulitis is already traumatized right and the um, and the pack cold pack or or ice or or even hot packs or warm packs uh, so we talked a little bit about some of the other conditions i already talked about this all right sounds good by the way if you are over 40 you are much higher uh, at risk to get this kind of thing than if you're younger so it's just part of aging that you know you just don't heal quite as fast or you have a somewhat higher chance to get infection comorbidities are also an issue uh, i'm a type 2 diabetic so therefore i may heal more slowly although i never heal more slowly until now so but indeed i have life a happens. scientific reason life happens i have a scientific reason why that why that could happen immunity decreases over time right that's why more people are having problems with covid right who are much older which is very sad for us much older people oh, I, don't, I, I don't consider you much older oh much older than what the the hills the <laughs> <laughs> there you go that was a good one all right so anyhow antibiotics okay you yes. need to have antibiotics if you're the medic and we talked, uh, was it just last podcast, video, the last video yes, podcast? Yes, we talked about antibiotics last time. We talked about antibiotics and show and tell, to, show and told yes. a number of them for yes. you. And so the, the, you can't get Thomas Lab, Labs antibiotics anymore, but there are a number of different Although I did brands. have someone write to me today who said they could find Thomas Labs antibiotics. Yeah, but what's the... It was like in, in Walmart or something. Yeah, but they probably you know close, close to the to expiration, expiration yes that's the thing because they're not producing any more exactly than they are so whatever Supposedly people have not. that's great but if you can get fresh antibiotics you know even though i talk about expiration dates i'll talk about that in, in another show the that expiration dates aren't anything absolute the truth is if you have your choice you have two bottles of antibiotics and that you can only afford one and this one here expires in three years this one expires in six months guess which one you should buy all right so anyhow um antibiotics can be topical put them on the skin they can be oral they can be intravenous uh, the topical therapy is better for preventing infection than really treating it i was told by the dermatologist to put something on the skin but then again they are the kind of people that would say hey put something on the skin right well you but, had a little bit of that open scab actually i think it was still a scab when you saw her yes so she wanted to make sure that you know if that scab opened up that you had some antibiotic cream on there so there you go so and and, and indeed that's good although if you're out of antibiotics and you have access to honey raw unprocessed honey you think is a reasonable thing to also put on there or if you have which that, i did put on his leg mm -hmm. or silver ointment a silver ointment topically silver topically is was was the antibiotic before there were antibiotics and mm -hmm. so you know put some topical silver on it it's also a good thing that would work for that now oral antibiotics 
They're most commonly used for this kind of problem in modern times. So that's why I want you to have them in quantity if you're going to be the medically responsible person for a survival group or for an extended family. Right. Um, because cellulitis is usually caused by bacteria, it will usually go away with antibiotics within a 7 to 14 days of, of taking them. Mm -hmm. And many times it's much better even before then, but I want you to take the entire course of therapy right. because even if you kill 99%, even if 1%, well, they can still multiply right. if they still come survive back. and it can come back and that's like the last thing that you want because as a medic, your job is to keep people healthy and productive and you're going to lose people from uh, from these kinds of infections. I remember the History Channel uh, special called After Armageddon right. and some family, I, I forget what it was, but something happened, some family was on the road uh, in a survival scenario mm -hmm. and uh, the father, who was actually a paramedic, uh, hooked up with this survival group and was Assigned, garden, assigned to garden. Yes, right? gardening. And he cut himself somehow, and he the area got red and irrita irritated and swollen, and he got a cellulitis. And he had no antibiotics, and neither did the, uh, the medic. Any a medic of the survival group. And so for the next three or four weeks, he watched it kind of climb up his body, and basically he died. Uh, four weeks later, knowing exactly what was wrong and exactly what would have taken care of exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> and I hate that, I'll tell you. Um, penicillin family drugs, cephalosporins like Keflex, erythromycin. These are good things to start off with. Uh, amoxicillin is popular. Uh, cephalexin is popular. Uh, MRSA needs to be treated not with those, but with other ones like uh, the sulfa drug combination. Right. of Bactrim. Uh, right. And... Uh, <clears throat> Clindamycin is another one, cleosin or lincosin. These are some that can be used that would treat MRSA. It's, it's important to, like I said, complete the entire course of therapy. That means that you have to have enough antibiotics to do so. Right. So if you have exactly one bottle of antibiotics and you're going to be the medic for 20 people, well, guess what? You probably need more antibiotics. Um, dosing, I'll tell you the doses, I guess, real quick. I'll just read them off. If it's penicillin, amoxicillin, erythromycin, or ceflexin, Keflex, 500 milligrams orally four times a day for seven to 14 days. This is for adults. Uh, clindamycin, 300 milligrams orally three to four times a day for seven to 10 days. Okay. Doxycycline's an option too. 200 milligrams once, then 100 milligrams orally twice a day for 10 days. And sulfa drugs, uh, sulfa methoxazole, trimethoprim, uh, 800 uh, sulfamethoxazole 160 trimethoprim, this is a combination drug, uh, orally twice a day for seven to ten days. Usually that would be the doses that are okay. Now, of course, you can be allergic to any one of these medications, and so you have to be aware that you're taking a risk there. Not all of them are, use, are good to use in pregnancy or to, good to use in, the, in infants, so I'm going to make you do your own research on that. You can actually find a lot of information in our books, uh, Alton's Antibiotics and Infectious Disease, The Survival Medicine Handbook, and uh, all of our free, a lot of our free articles also address these I topics. If, I don't know if they saw that one book, but I'll hold that one up. <laughs> oh, okay. There That's you go. Okay. okay. Um, the longer the therapy and the higher the dose, the more likely some adverse reaction may occur. Some people may get diarrhea. Some people may feel nauseous or get headachey. Everybody's a little different. And indeed, I got to tell you that all sources that are even highly qualified medical sources may not agree with each other as to exact the exact dose, the amount, exact amount of time you should take the medicines. Or even the that's, combination. Or even the combination. Because sometimes they want you to take two of them that's at right. the same time. Or even the combination. And sure enough. You know, there you'll you'll see somewhere different dosages and different uh, length of duration of therapy than what I told you. Matter of fact, if you line up five doctors, you probably get five different uh, results <laughs> with regards to their recommendations. Hopefully, there's some overlap, though. <laughs> so anyhow, you as medic have to dispense antibiotics. But the thing is, is it's important to know that antibiotics are not candy they should only be used when absolutely necessary we have misused antibiotics not only doctors have misused antibiotics patients have misused antibiotics and indeed agribusiness 
has misused antibiotics. 80% of antibiotics go to food producing livestock, not because they're sick and need an antibiotic to cure an infection, but because it makes them grow faster and get to market sooner. Nobody really knows why this is, but that is indeed the case. And there are some countries that indeed have banned the use of antibiotics routinely on uh, food producing livestock. Denmark is one, for Good. example, and doesn't seem to be any higher risk of uh, food poisoning. We don't need to give like our that. food anything that shouldn't be in there. Right. Unless an animal is sick, it should not be getting an antibiotic. Well, let me talk about abscesses for a minute. Abscess is a collection of pus. Uh, pus is the debris left over from your body's attempt to fight an infection. And it consists of white cells and red blood cells and live and dead microbes, not bugs, micro <laughs> My microbes, go, not see? crickets. More no. accurate, yes. <laughs> and, it, and inflammatory fluid. And you know, sometimes it's called a boil, sometimes it's called folliculitis, if it's related to a hair follicle. Yep. Um, if the abscess was not caused by an infected wound or a diseased teeth, it's possible that it originated in a cyst. Some people have cysts also on their skin. Uh, that's a hollow, walled-off structure that's filled with fluid, and it could get infected and fill, become pus. Um, this can occur just about anywhere. You can have cysts in your liver that could turn into abscesses, although there's not much you would be able to do as the off-grid medic for that. Right. Uh, there are sebaceous cysts. Uh, these are the ones that are associated with hair follicles. They produce not pus, but something called sebum, uh, which is sort of an oily material. Uh, there are inclusion cysts when uh, uh, people have had surgery and the skin wasn't approximated just right. Sometimes the skin underneath other, another layer of skin can form into a, a roundish cyst. Uh, then there's a polynidal cyst, which is terrible. They're located over the area of your tailbone, and they are due to uh, actually a malformation that occurred during fetal development, but they can easily become infected and wind up. I've seen a lot of people in the ER that have had to deal, had to have those drained. So speaking of drained, you know, the body's attempt to cure an infection is pretty formidable. Uh, it tends to wall off infection, right? But that's great because it helps prevent spread, but it also makes it difficult for antibiotics to penetrate. And as such, you may have to intervene by performing a procedure to drain the abscess. So you have to make a channel so that the pus can make its way to the outside. And the easiest way to do this is to place warm, moist compresses over the area. We call this ripening the abscess. And if you apply the compress over the area for 15 minutes or so, on and off, uh, every couple hours really, during the day, then that helps bring the infection to the surface of the skin where it may form a white, white head or some other kind of head and hopefully drain spontaneously. And if that happens, you'll start, not if it's being successful, you'll notice that the abscess will go from firm to soft in, as, it, as it ripens. And so that's something that would, right? Yep, Okay. comes to the top. Yep, there you go. Now, if a few days happen, was time goes by, if you don't see spontaneous drainage, this boil is getting bigger, well, you may have to lance it. Lancing a boil, or in medical ease we call it incision and drainage, uh, is something that you may have to do in your job as medic over, uh, in, off the grid, rather. Uh, first, wash your hands. Always wash your hands before you do anything uh, regarding a patient. Put on gloves before attempting this procedure, and sterile gloves are better if you happen to have them. Uh, and once your gloves are on, you need to clean the area with an antiseptic, uh, something like oh, good. iodine would be I like the show and tell. Good. Yeah, the, right? There you go. And um, apply a numbing agent if you have it, even if you have just ice. Ice may help to... to decreases the feeling a little bit and otherwise as mu it's as much as you can do when you don't have any lidocaine kind of right. yep then um, you would use a sharp sterile instrument uh, if you have a scalpel uh, the number 11 scalpel and number 15 scalpel these would be the best ones for this uh, if you don't have a sterile instrument you put the blade over a fire uh, until it becomes red hot and then let it cool then you pierce the skin over the abscess perpendicular to the surface of the skin. And the pus should drain freely. I'll tell you, your patient will probably feel much better the second that pus, the pressure right, from that right, pus is released. Because right. that is something. Because, boy, I'll tell you, people can really, really have a lot of pain from these Ooh, abscesses. Oh, I used to have those when I was a kid. Right. There we you called go. them boils. boils. My brother right. and I would get them on our legs. 
I don't know, maybe it's because we lived out in the boondocks. Boondocks could and be. And climbed trees and did all kinds of crazy kid stuff. But yeah, uh, they'd come at me with something and I would scream and run away. And then they would hold me down <laughs> and pop it. Either, either stick something in it, like a needle, or uh, sometimes uh, my mom would distract me and my dad would come like this. <laughs> and then this pus Ouch. would come shooting up like a gosh darn Ouch. volcano. Oh my gosh. My brother and I both had them. Oh, sometimes they were like this big. Well, people actually... And like that yeah. tall. I mean, we're talking yeah. about like horrifying. But thankfully, we were kids. Yeah. And we never took antibiotics for them. It's they amazing. They would put some cream on it yeah. and cover it. We'd heal just fine. Now, that's actually the common thing that a lot of people think that you should do. But you need to do a little bit more if, if you want this thing not to come back. If you want it not to come back, of course, you want to use some of the oral antibiotics that I, I just mentioned for cellulitis. But also, what you need to use is like a small, maybe a small curved clamp, like um, you'll see in uh, Amy's uh, minor surgery kit that's going to be on her Here, website I'll hold it soon. Up. And uh, here's the what, curves. So, what you here's do is you, you take something like this and go inside with the uh, clamp closed and then open it up to break up little walls that have formed, uh, compartments that have formed, called loculations. The walls of, of these compartments are called loculations. And indeed, you want to break those up and, and that makes sure that you have drained the maximum amount of pus or inflammatory fluid as you possibly can. I think, by the way, it's, it's a good idea at home. <laughs> It's a good idea to have some extra gauze handy because a large boil can be pretty messy to treat it's, and you may be very foul. Now, there's a show, cable show called Dr. Pimple Popper oh, and she does this gosh. kind of stuff all the time and is gross as you can imagine. All get out. We'll say gross as <laughs> all get out. Once I you actually... dropping stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's because I put them in wrong. It's my fault. <laughs> Once, once you've managed to drain the abscess, what you need to do is you need to there use your go. irrigation syringe. If you have one of our kits, we've got an irrigation syringe, and so you need to flush it out, get out all the debris, all the pus that might be just sticking to the walls uh, of that abscess. That's important. And then I would pack a, a thin gauze. I cut a thin, I cut a strip of gauze. I pack it with some betadine or uh, impregnate some betadine into it. It's, then wait, it's also called iodoform. Iodoform. And if you had told me you were going to talk about that, I would have No, you have some iodoform? Of course, I have everything. Okay, good. There's nothing that you've talked about I, know, I don't well, have. Well, I knew we have it in, in the office, but <laughs> I didn't know we had it here. But of anyhow, course. iodoform packing. I-O-D-O-F-O-R-M packing. Good idea to have that. comes in different sizes depending on, the so on what you need. Uh, and then apply an antibiotic ointment or raw unprocessed honey to the skin surrounding the incision that you made. So, and then I want you to cover it with an adhesive bandage or gauze dressing because it could continue to drain. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's important. Daily care means that you change the packing on a regular basis, daily at least, twice daily is even better, until the abscess cavity fills in on its own. The abscess returns, however, sometimes you actually have to go in there and you have to actually take the walls out, which is a more complex surgical procedure you have these kind of instruments would be are we open it back up yeah, open. <laughs> okay you would need open you would need a fine scissors a fine scissors and, and you would need things to hold um clamps to hold it here's the tweezers tooth tweezers here is um retractor a retractor that would allow you to open a particularly large if you're listening one. to this podcast you can go on our website on store.doomandbloom.net and see the minor surgical or minor surgery set that there you I'm go. going to put up. And Good. you'll see all of these interest instruments that we are discussing. So that's the thing. Now, of course, for dental abscesses, you can do something sort of similar. The only problem is that you probably are not going to be able to save nearby teeth. If a tooth is involved with a, with a dental abscess, Oftentimes that root is rotten and it's just not going to be successful. You know, you may wind up losing some teeth. Uh, but then again, it's better than dying, which indeed a lot of Egyptians apparently did from tooth abscesses. I think they found the mummy of Nefertiti recently and she had a big old hole in her jaw, which was probably related exactly to that, to a right. tooth abscess. 
So, oh, I want to do a little just. I just want. I just want to do a little show and tell. Let me see what I got here. Uh, okay. How are you going to do this for the podcast? I've got no. The, <laughs> the audio podcast is not going to feature this. Aren't you okay. lucky? <laughs> well, our grapefruit tree. You had better not sleep and take a nap under our grapefruit tree oh, because yeah. you're going to yep. be bopped on the head on with the head. all sorts of our grapefruits here. You see, they're they're green, but over the course of time, they turned yellow. Oh. But there you almost can, too heavy to you can feel when they're soft and that they're good. And here is indeed 54 bananas. 54 bananas. And want to know something? This is the smallest bunch of bananas that our trees have produced. And I'm going to dehydrate them because they're ripening and starting to split. And they are tasty. Oh, we love them. Mm -mm -mm. Um, I think that's all we should uh, talk about today. I don't have a million topics on medical preparedness. We are medical preparedness advocates, Joe Alden, MD. This is Amy Alton. <laughs> Amy Alton, ARNP. Nurse practitioner. Nurse practitioner, Amy Alton. And we thank you so much for listening uh, to wa and watching our podcast, and we will be back next time. Bye. Hey, please consider supporting our mission to put a medically prepared person in every family by getting some of the quality medical kits, individual supplies, and personal protection gear available at store.doomandbloom.net.